Well, it's a pleasure to be here tonight, and thank you, Lori, for being a wonderful hostess and the organizer of this wonderful series. Um, the first, uh, I'll begin by reading a text which is remote from Dante chronologically, uh, which is the poem by Montale, Eugenio Montale. Uh, Forse un mattino andando in un'aria di vetro arida, Rivolgendomi vedrò compirsi il miracolo, il nulla alle mie spalle, il vuoto dietro di me, con un terrore di ubriaco. Poi, come su uno schermo, s'accamperanno di gitto alberi, case, colli, per l'inganno consueto, ma sarà troppo tardi, ed io me ne andrò zitto, tra gli uomini che non si voltano, con il mio segreto. These two quatrains of free verses are an osso by Eugenio Montale, a poem that is from his early collection, Ossi di Seppia. At the onset of the text, Montale formulates a wish. Better, he announces a self-investitor. Montale bestows a special ability upon himself, and I believe here the self stands as a sign for the general category of poetry makers. Is my voice loud enough? Yes. Can you hear me? Very good. No, no. I think maybe you could go to my phone a little bit closer to you. No? The microphone? Oh, this one. Yeah. Perfect. Because I have to, very good. Um, Montale bestows a special ability upon himself, and I believe here the self stands as a sign for the general category of poetry makers. The special ability is the condition on which poets might or might not, the forse at the incipit sets the tone for a suspension, receive a revelation. Poets might be the recipient of this revelation because they are gifted with the especially acute capacity to see that behind what we think of as a vision of concrete things and volumes, there is a void. The poem states the, exper the experience in detail. Montale depicts the poet as an anonymous passerby and envisions that on a given day, while he's walking in the climatic conditions ideal for the experiment about to be evoked, air is clear as if it were made of glass and dry, the poet might turn back and catch a glimpse for a brief moment of what we believe corresponds to reality. The quick cropping of the elements included in our vision, alberi, case, colli, the basic objects we find in a child's drawing. In that moment, Montale claims, the poet could unveil a fundamental truth about reality. That re Thank you, I hadn't thought about it. That reality is deception. That which our senses perceive as concrete consists, in fact, in the projection of images on a screen. According to Montale's conclusions, human beings who believe they live immersed in a world of substances and forms actually only see bidimensional images. The flat world of things hinted at in Montale's poem requires an observer. Outside of the passerby's field of vision described by Montale, reality does not exist. It is precisely the observer's quick glance to the space he just left behind that allows him to understand how things work, because that glance is what provokes the assembling of images on the screen. And when that glance is directed backward, it is what allows the observer to see that assembling in progress. Reality, in other words, is simply the effect of human sensorial capacities and does not have an existence of its own. Montale calls this revelation a miracle. The paradox of this denomination is manifest. The miracle in Montale's world is not the ephemeral and superhuman ability to stretch our imagination to the point of being able to contemplate the divine and to acknowledge its presence in the mundane world but rather the ability to realize that we, we humans, are deceived in even what we think is our basic capacity, our senses. As is well known to Montale's reader, this fortuitous understanding and awareness is elsewhere in his works, indicated through expressions such as accident of nature or a broken mesh in the net all definitions that, that better than miracle suit the drastic lack of divine design ruling Montale's world. Although the obscure and mechanical universe imagined by Montale and the inescapably divine world of the comedy seem impossible to conciliate, 
My reading will try to draw some links between the two texts, especially on the grounds of rhetorical procedures of how language is made. I introduced my lecture with the Montale poem as I believe in it there are meaningful connections with the themes I want to focus on for Paradiso IV. As I mentioned above, the achievement obtained after the miracle in the Osso is the possibility to be aware that reality is deceitful because it's fictional. While this notion is clearly a product of 20th century culture, what I find meaningful in relation to Dante's Paradiso is, that the, re is the fact that the revelation Montale is seeking is a preternatural experiment that, in his perspective, can be performed only by a poet and consequently delivered only through a poetic text. Both Dante and Montale share, I claim, the assumption that a poet's capacities consist in functioning like a catalyst inside a dimension which is truthful, even though it surpasses the senses of the known poets, including those of the readers. Going back to Montale's lines, it is the motion of the observer through the transparent and dry air that activates the process which composes the elements in his field of vision. And it is the sudden and unexpected in the common sequence of things and movements turning back of the poet that reveals the trick. It is in the poet's eyes that, eyes that these elements are caught while they are still have to congregate. I believe it is not accidental that Montale imagines a turning back of the poet, a movement that is, which is the literal dramatization of the conversion at the core of the entire comedy. The metaphor at the beginning of the Commedia in which the pilgrim is compared to the castaway who reaches the shore and turning back sees what he just crossed must stay as a powerful image in literary minds. In the last lines of his poem, Montale makes clear that this revelation is a burden for the poet. The experience that revealed the truth to him cannot be shared, quote from Montale, io me ne andrò zitto tra gli uomini che non si voltano col mio segreto. To function as a catalyst on the text's content as well as its form becomes a responsibility for the poet. While the experience is private and not shareable, its conveyance can be successful carried out precisely through the poetic form. Here is the link I established between the text I began with and Dante's Canto Paradiso IV. The employment of the poet's gaze as a tool able to see a reality undetectable to conventional eyes because the poet's gaze produces that reality and subsequently is also made into its messenger. The whole cantica of the Paradiso is a rhetorical struggle aiming at capturing what by definition escaped the author's senses, therefore his memory. The vision of the divine, that is the vision of the divine. Paradiso is a text whose linguistic components are purely literary, that is, with no reference whatsoever to reality. As John Frecero has acutely remarked, Dante's Paradiso stands as one of the two terms of a metaphor, the other one being the first two cantiche, Inferno Purgatorio. The topic I would like to explore and reflect upon is how specifically Dante addresses and carries out this rhetorical enterprise in Canto IV and how this enterprise is connected to the ethical substratum of the canto. Poetry making is a theme handled throughout Dante's work. If we consider Paradiso IV from the perspective of the internal memory of the divine comedy, I think that this canto of the Paradiso is connected to Purgatorio 24, precisely on the grounds of the writing process. There are a few common themes in the two canti. The issue of will and desire, widely explored in both, of food and desire thereof, as well as of Piccarda Donati, mentioned in Purgatorio 24, and identified as one of the first main blessed souls the pilgrim meets as he begins his ascent to the Empyrean. However, I'm interested in drawing a correspondence based on the fact that both in Purgatorio 24 and in Paradiso 4, Dante expresses the notion of a language obedient to its object, that is, a cognitive language. 
In both canti, Dante employs the verb spirare, which is clearly crucial to his conclusions about rhetorics. In Purgatorio 24, Dante introduces the language of the fedeli d'amore, the faithful of love, still novel poets, who faithfully write that love inspires them with what love dictates to them. In the Paradiso, that language is brought to a higher and more challenging level, since it must convey an experience which was not recorded by the senses, as Dante often recalls to the few readers that follow him to the last part of his journey. Paradiso 4 is a canto strongly structured as an argumentation about ethical issues. In my reading, I suggest that those ethical issues are bound to the notion of writing. Specifically, I consider the relation between writing and desire, or individual will, which is at the center of Dante's argumentation. Writing, we shall see, gains fluidity and ease when individual desire is well addressed. That is, when individual desire is synchronized with the absolute will, as Beatrice defines it. I believe that the process of writing, as is described in this canto, stands as a proof of yet another overcoming of individual will, in order to let the absolute one determine the pilgrim's, the pilgrim's actions as well as the poet's composition. The canto introduces an incomparable and perfected model for writing, the fluid outpouring of an unrestrainable flow of words represented by Beatrice's speech, which Dante glosses by using the metaphor of the ondeggiar del santo rio che uscì dal fonte ogni, onde ogni verde riva. While the pilgrim is getting closer to the accomplishment of his journey, the poet is getting closer to mimic and carry out that same fluidity and ease of expression that Beatrice shows. I'm going back to Montale one last time before I turn to Dante's text. The experience of the pilgrim in the Commedia on one hand and of the walker we find in Montale's text on the other are poles apart. While the walker discovers that the notion of a perceiving subject is ungrounded and that consequently sensorial reality is fictional, the pilgrim discovers that sensorial reality is the reflection of a supernatural reality that eludes our senses but is nevertheless true. As any Dante reader knows, the product of the pilgrim's imagination, once this imagination has been filled with grace, corresponds to the highest degree of knowledge available to humans, the contemplation of God. Despite the antithetical content, however, in both cases, Dante's and Montale's case, only poets may aspire to the pronunciation of this revelation. What links the two texts is that the poet is invested with special powers. In both texts, the poet is the recipient of a supernatural experience and the only means of delivery of such experience. The display of uncommon skills is not new to Dante. As we shall see in Canto IV, once again, the author of the Divine Comedy plays with the notion of his own demiurgic ability, proved by the very existence of the lines before the reader's eyes. Now to the subject matter of the canto. We should notice right away that in the case of Canto IV, the articulation linking the single cantos is particularly evident. As in other occurrences in the poema, Dante creates a sequence of canti, which in this case are grouped by three, three, four, and five, as if replicating on the grounds of the big structure of the poema, the triadic figure of the terzina. As I mentioned already, the main themes of the argumentation are related to ethics. Such themes unfold from a dialogue between the pilgrim and Beatrice, that is, from the set of the pilgrim's three questions followed by Beatrice's answers. In fact, in the course of the canto, the pilgrim poses two questions, leaving his third and last for the conclusion of the canto. The answer to the last one is a structural bond since it will be a matter for Canto V. Therefore, Canto IV develops basically around the two answers that Beatrice gives to the pilgrim. Her second answer includes an additional explanation, a corollary, that expounds a difficult passage that, Beatrice alerts the reader, Dante alone would not have been able to untangle. It should be noted, <clears throat> 
with regard to the linguistic issue, that the pilgrim doesn't actually express his questions verbally. Right at the beginning of this canto, while he is representing the silence of his character, Dante returns to an important notion at the foundation of his commedia. The notion consists of the correspondence between movement in space and evolution of the soul. The source for this metaphorical representation through corporeal movement of the soul's spiritual development is Plato's Timaeus, mentioned for different reasons in this same count. The pilgrim silence is explained through spatial metaphors. Now I'm reading for the canto, and I'm sorry I don't have here the lines, it's just the beginning, the beginning lines. In tra due cibi distanti e moventi, d'un modo, prima si morria di fame che liber uomo l'un recasse ai denti. Sì, si starebbe un agno in tra due brame di fieri lupi, ugualmente temendo. Sì, si starebbe un cane in tra due dame, perché si mia tacea me non riprendo dalle mie dubbi d'un modo sospinto, poi che era necessario ne commendo. In this specific case, Dante describes the oscillation of the pilgrim's soul as he seeks an answer to the ethical issues which have arisen from the preceding canto in terms of a body agitated stillness. In order to make the condition of the pilgrim more graphic to the readers, Dante uses three metaphors. The first is about a man, a man, the others about animals. These metaphors have a few interesting characteristics. The first one, which compares the pilgrim to a man overwhelmed by, by the choice between two foods offering, equally removed and tempting, has a dramatic outcome. He would die of hunger if his choice were free. This metaphor refers to the example attributed to the 14th century philosopher Jean Buridan, that of the hungry donkey that would starve to death between two haystacks. In the course of the canto, the topic of food undergoes a metamorphosis, or rather an indiamento. It gets closer to the theological frame of mind. If at, the beginning of, if at the beginning the desire for food is clearly a response to biological need, toward the end of the canto, the pilgrim will comment upon Beatrice's speech by saying that his intellect is finally saziato, satisfied therefore employing food in its theological register. Two indications with regard to this notion are uh, that knowledge is uh, food for the intellect are in the scriptures. In his comments on Ezekiel, when the prophet is instructed to eat the book, Jerome glosses, quote, eating the book is the starting point of reading and of basic history. When by diligent meditation, we store away the book of Lord in our memorial treasury, our belly is filled spiritually and our guts are satisfied. And of course, there are many more examples in which, again, reading is a food for the soul and the intellect. The food that the pilgrim receives from Beatrice, the food, is so intense that he collapses at the end of the canto. Beatrice mi guardò con gli occhi pieni di faville d'amor, that's the very end così divini che vinta mia virtute die le reni e quasi mi perdei con gli occhi chini. Following the intense intellectual satisfaction, Dante is here having the pilgrim enact the excessus mentis described by mystical literature as the culminating point of the encounter with God. Two more metaphors follow that of the man caught between two tempting and literal foods. They are striking because rather than supporting each other, reinforcing the point that Dante wants to make, the last two metaphors sound specular to each other by attributing to the main term of the metaphor, the pilgrim, two very different and in fact opposite functions. First, the pilgrim is compared to a prey between two predators and then to a predator between two preys. Since the main theme is the struggle that individual will has to face and its evolution towards the notion of absolute will, this two-faced image serves the purpose, I think, of depicting individual will as both prey and predator of the individual soul. 
trapped inside a closed circuit and unable to surpass its limited boundaries, unable to move unless it bends towards God's will, unless really it aligns with God's will. In the opening scene of the canto, the pilgrim therefore stands silent. Beatrice, however, is able to know his questions, which both the pilgrim and she call desire, desir. I will go back later to this word and the notion it announces. Beatrice, in other words, I'm sorry, um, both the pilgrim and, and, and she call desire, and, and Beatrice is able to read again before the pilgrim pronounces them. Beatrice, in other words, is able to read the pilgrim's mind and, in fact, promptly starts to produce her answers. The dialogue preliminary to the argumentation of the canto is wordless. This type of silent communication is what, in Dante's worlds, characterizes the angelic creatures and the way the angels talk to each other. Departing from the assumptions of St. Thomas and of the majority of the scholastic philosophers, in his De Vulgari Eloquentia, Dante writes that angels possess a communicative power that make it possible for them to communicate without uttering words. By depicting angels as diaphanous, that is transparent, Dante concludes that angels do not need words to reveal their thoughts, since their intellects are openly displayed. In Dante's opinion, the angels communicate their glorious conceptions through their intellects, quote, through which either they make themselves in themselves completely known to each other or at least are reflected in the fullness of their beauty and ardor by that resplendent mirror which retains an image of all of them." End of quote from the De Vulgari Eloquentia. To be more precise, in the opening scene of Paradiso IV, Beatrice reads the pilgrim face or his intellect through his face. Quote, Io mi tacea, ma il mio disir dipinto mera nel viso, e il dimandar con ello più caldo assai che per parlar distinto. The pilgrim bears on his face the signs of his thoughts, which Beatrice reads without having heard his words. The pilgrim's face, in other words, is like a page. Dante is not new to this procedure. Another crucial instance in which a face is treated like a page is with Manfredi in Purgatorio III. However, this is a recurrent procedure specific to the third cantica and specifically connected to the notion of an empyrean language. In Paradiso III, Dante employs the same metaphor. In the preceding canto, Paradiso III, Dante had indicated the outlines of Picarda and Costanza's faces, the two souls that he meets there, outlined by the glosses. I'm sorry, um, I indicate the outlines of Picard and Costanza's faces as postille, which means glosses. Therefore, producing in the reader's mind the overlapping of face profiles and written pages, outlined by glosses. By suggesting the reader to look at celestial faces as if they were engraved written pages, Dante points at a way of communication which surpasses the conventional human tongue. In other words, Dante's direction here is to indicate human language as superfluous and unnecessary. The signs on the pilgrim face in Canto IV, however, are marked by his desire, that is, his individual will. The signs impressed by God's will must be other, almost transparent and barely detectable signs the signs left by an impression of light on a white page. I'll go back to this notion of signs later. What are the pilgrim's questions about? Referring to the dialogue he had with one of the two blessed he encountered in the preceding canto, Piccarda Donati, the pilgrim is questioning why she has been degraded in her rank in heaven. Her will was good, Dante claims. She was forced to bend it by her persecutors uomini al male più che al bene usi, who wanted her out of the monastery so that her brother could accomplish his plan to make her marry. Se il buon voler dura, Dante observes through the mouth of Beatrice, la violenza altrui per qual ragione di meritar mi scema la misura. 
The second query regards the pilgrim's observation that the souls of Paradiso, by appearing to him on distant planets, seem to confirm the doctrine proposed by Plato in the Timaeus, according to whom each human soul has its own place, has, has its own planet or star, to which it returns between its reincarnations until finally it, set, it settles in it forever. Beatrice answers this last query first, since, as she claims, it is the most insidious, and explains to the pilgrim that, yes, it is true, all the blessed souls he encounters are distributed through the sequence of planets, but that that disposition on the planets is fictional. It is just a device that allows the pilgrim to see and to understand. All of the souls, in fact, belong to the same dimension. I'm reading here lines 28-36. Dei serafin colui che più si india, Moisè, Samuele, quel Giovanni, che prender vuoli, io dico, non Maria, non hanno in altro cielo i loro scanni che questi spirti che motta pariro, ne hanno all'esser lor più o meno anni, ma tutti fanno bello il primo giro, e differentemente hanno dolce vita per sentir più e meno l'eterno spiro. The reason why they appear to the pilgrim as if they belong to different sites is explained by Beatrice in terms of a linguistic necessity. Here are the third sets that are crucial to my reading. That's uh, lines 37 to 48. Qui si mostraro, Beatrice says, non perché sortita sia questa spera lor, ma per far segno della celestial can men salita. Così parlar convienzi al vostro ingegno, però che solo da sensato apprende ciò che fa poscia di intelletto degno. Per questo la scrittura condescende a vostra facultate, e piedi e mano attribuisce a Dio ed altro intende. E Santa Chiesa con aspetto umano Gabriel e Michel vi rappresenta, e l'altro che Tobia rifece sano. Here, through Beatrice's words, the pilgrim understands something important about the Paradiso, that the souls are not organized according to a spe specially configured hierarchy, since they all belong to the same place, the Empyrean. But within that common location, they are differentiated by the extent to which they can absorb the light of God. Each soul can absorb a different amount of light, that is of grace, in relation to its early, earthly conduct. This information is delivered by the souls themselves. However, since the recipient is the pilgrim's human intellect, which apprehends only through the senses, the souls must far segno, as Beatrice says. They must make themselves into the characters of an alphabet that the pilgrim will be able to see and to read. In other words, they must be perceivable by a subject that is human, therefore through his senses. In order to communicate with the human subject, the divine writing, Beatrice adds, needs to condescendere to the human subject's limitation. When Dante has the souls of the blessed in the Paradiso descend from the Empyrean and arrange themselves in the pilgrim's field of vision, Dante translates that condescending literally by dramatizing it that is, so that the pilgrim can understand a content otherwise invisible to him. The mistake, of the, the mistake of the pilgrim was to rely on the Timaeus doctrine. Beatrice doesn't fully dismiss Plato's conclusions, suggesting that its, in that its interpreters were erroneous and that perhaps Plato meant something true, that is, that individuals are influenced by the planets. After having clarified the meaning of the notion of hierarchy ruling the blessed souls, Beatrice goes on to the first desir th that she read on the pilgrim's face. How is it possible, the pilgrim had questioned, for someone to lose the merit of his or, or her goodwill when it is bent by a force it cannot resist? Beatrice answers by saying that although it is very rare, humans can if they want, express a salda voglia, with which to resist the force imposed on them. The will of the two blessed souls, in terms specifically referring to Dante's question, could have resisted 
Picarda and Costanza, could have resisted the force acting upon them, and they could have fled back to their holy shelters. This is the explanation to which Beatrice attaches her corollary regarding the alleged sincerity of the blessed, contradicted by what Picarda claimed to Dante in the Las Canto, quote, che l'affezion di Costanza tenne. While talking about Costanza, glosses Beatrice, Picarda was not taking into consideration the fundamental distinction between absolute and relative will. Therefore, Beatrice concludes, we both have spoken truth. With these words, the ondeggiare del santo rio, as Dante has defined Beatrice's speech, stops, and the pilgrim thanks her, letting the river flood his intellect, which can finally rest. At this point, at the end of the canto, Dante returns to, the two, of the, to two of the metaphors he used at the beginning, and amends them in the light of the conceptual and ethical clarification Beatrice has brought to his mind. The two foods which are equally removed and tempting for the man in the metaphor at the beginning are in the end turned into the allegorical intellectual food of the divine truth, which nurtures the pilgrim's intellect. Quote, io veggio ben, che giammai non si sazia nostro intelletto se il ver non lo illustra, di fuor dal qual nessun vero si spazia. With regard to the second metaphor, prey and its predators, that were at the beginning of the canto caught in the open and unable to move, are now transforming into a radically different image. Dante describes the resting of his intellect in the truth as the repose of a beast within its lair. My suggestion is that with the second metaphor from the animal kingdom, Dante evokes through the image of a beast's dwelling, the enclosed space of a monk's cell meant as the protected and clearly mapped space in which the subject initiate his meditation. Within one canto, the pilgrim advances on his spiritual path and the poet perfects his metaphors, adapting them for that spiritual advancement. This is the general narrative of the canto, an argumentative canto, as I introduced in the beginning, whose structure is strictly devoted to the relation of absolute will to relative will. Against the background of this general structure, I would like to emphasize a few paths indicated by Dante. In addition to the ethical issues it poses, the struggle of individual will or desire to become universal, there is another subtext, specifically a subtext that touches upon linguistic issues. By exploring these issues, I, hi I highlight also the connections between desire and writing. That is, I focus on how the alignment of human desire with absolute will, with divine will, affects writing. With regard to this, I believe that Dante in Canto IV establishes Beatrice's speech as a model for a natural and harmonic flowing of language, one that requires no effort. I highlight the connections between ethics and grammar by following the surfacing of a few terms key to my point. The terms I indicate are desire, which overlaps velle, will, spirare, and far segno. Through the articulation of these terms, what becomes visible is the weaving of the two crucial themes of the canto, ethics and writing. The theme of language is indicated by Dante himself, who in the pages of the second book of the banquet establishes functional correspondences between the planets and the subject matters of medieval curriculum study. The first heaven, the moon, is associated with grammar. Given the two main characteristics that Dante attributes to it, its shadows and the variation of its luminosity, the moon resembles grammar. Quoting from the um, banquet. Che per la sua infinitade, li raggi della ragione in essa non si terminano, in parte specialmente degli vocaboli, e luce or di qua or di là, 
intanto in quanto certi vocaboli, certe declinazioni, certe costruzioni sono in uso che già non furono e molte già furono che ancora saranno. Sì, come dice Orazio nel principio della poetria quando dice molti vocaboli rinasceranno che già accaddero. End of quote. As is well known, Dante's conclusions in the banquet will later be surpassed and abruptly dismissed as pueril coto, a childish thought, in Paradiso mm, too. The explanation of the moon's shadows by means of the rarità of that heaven, of a diversification of its matter, is corrected by Beatrice, who fixes the old theory expressed in the banquet by explaining that the shadows of the moon are not caused by bodies rari e densi, but rather by a virtù diversa che fa diversa lega, that is by the multiple projections of light emanating through the Empyrean according to the formal principle governing the process of, the, of differentiation of one into the multiple. In the course of his work, not only Dante does understand that his formulation on the nature of the spots shadowing the moon's surface was a false one, but he also amends the theory about language. As we read in the quotation I, from the banquet uh, before, the moon's rarità corresponds to the infinitate of grammar, which is infinite because the rays of reason cannot illuminate it evenly while the variation in brightness of the moon is related to the variation of language in which some words, some declinations, some constructions are and were not used, and many were in the past and will be again. After the banquet, Dante will read language infinitate and variability as positive features. In his essay dedicated to Dante's language, Bruno Nardi has traced the evolution of Dante's thought, pointing out the most powerful passages with regard to language theory, from the new life to the banquet to the De Vulgari, and finally to Paradiso 26. Dante's belief moves towards the necessity of an increasing mobility and autonomy of language, whose highest form is no longer Latin, but the locutio vulgaris, the vernacular. The historical fact already pointed out in the banquet of a natural variability of languages is made into a concept in the De Vulgari Eloquentia, where language mutability becomes a verified consequence of the mutability of human nature. In the De Vulgari, the locutio vulgaris is considered superior precisely because it is naturalis, while what Dante refers to as grammatica is understood as an artificial hardening of the linguistic element that must be free instead to evolve according to human evolution. As is uh, uh, well known, the, the last point of this uh, evolution in Dante's theory about language is in Paradiso with Adam. Um, because Adam in the Paradiso speaks as the craftsman of his own language, l'idioma che io usai e che io fei, therefore making this idea of transformative language the best language possible. The idea of a linguistic evolution is also carried out inside the Commedia, which employs language in its different stages. Going back to our canto, how does grammar connect to individual will or desire? And how is writing affected by the alignment of the individual will, which is wrongful, with the absolute will, which is the divine. Once the individual quest is well nourished by the truth, it does not produce immobility, but on the contrary, an unrestrainable movement. Dante's dubbi at the beginning of the canto, which Beatrice refers to as desires, are connected to real food, as the metaphor clearly indicates. Therefore, that desire or will consists of a pleasure of the sensitive soul, conducive to animal happiness. On the other hand, the food that Dante is offered by Beatrice during the canto nourishes a pleasure of the intellect. It is the kind of desire with which Aristotle opens his metaphysics. All men by nature desire to know. There are exactly the same words that Dante uses to uh, begin his um, banquet, of course. Since knowledge is the ultimate perfection of our soul, in which resides our ultimate happiness, we are all, therefore, by nature, subject to a desire for it. 
These are the beginning words of the banquet. When the individual will become absolute, desire, when individual will, I'm sorry, becomes absolute, desire no longer corresponds to the stillness of the pilgrim at the beginning of the canto, but to his intellectual momentum described toward the end of the canto. Quote, io ve gioben, we already, uh, I already read these uh, lines before. Io ve gioben che giammai non si sazia nostro intelletto, se il ver non lo illustria, non lo illustra, di fuor dal qual nessun vero si spazia. Posas in esso come fera illustra, tosto che giunto là, e giugner puollo, se non ciascun disio sarebbe frustra. Nasce per quello a guisa di rimpollo, a piede del vero il dubbio, ed è natura che al sommo pinge noi di collo in collo. Simultaneously to this transformation of food and desire, grammar becomes a divine tool. Dante starts a sort of transfiguration of the pilgrim by describing his face as a page, a process that belongs to heaven, as I mentioned before for Picarda and Donata. Picarda and, Co Picarda and Costanza, excuse me. Picarda and Costanza that have faces like pages on which the pilgrim reads the rewriting of their lives according to a divine order. On the pilgrim's face in Canto IV, the grammar is, however, still dictated by his individual will, which, in fact, he refers to as dubbi. Beatrice, in her answer, will define the question of uh, Dante as velle, in rhyme with felle, to derogatorily underline it. This writing, however, will become, in the course of the canto, the kind of grammar the poet is aiming at forging his last cantica. Beatrice says that the two desires of the pilgrim are constricting him to such an extent that he cannot utter his questions. Beatrice uses the verb spirare. Io veggio ben come ti tira uno e altro disio, si che tua cura se stessa lega, si che fuor non si spira. The spira in these lines refers to voice, to the pilgrim's voice that he does not emit. But it connects also, I claim, but it is connected also to another spirare of the Divine Comedy, precisely to the famous and founding lines of Purgatorio 24. I mi son un che quando amor mi spira, noto, this is Dante talking to Bonagiunta da Luca, mm, che quando amor mi spira, noto, e a quel modo che i ditta dentro, vo significando. While detecting the freezing of the pilgrim spirare, Beatrice begins her monologue, which is exceptionally long and symbolical in its length. It's made of 33 tercets and 99 verses. While letting herself to be inspired, Beatrice also unveils to Dante the grammar that functions in heaven. The souls, she says, fanno segno. They move and dispose themselves in front of the pilgrim's eyes as a sign. This is an, a very important indication. The writing that Beatrice, the Beatrice shows to the pilgrim, therefore the writing that the poet is carrying out, is a self-effacing writing. This is how Dante defies the sensorial limitation in the sphere of language, composition, and delivery. Dante's writing in the Paradiso becomes literally a sign on the page whose force, as Dante claims in Canto III with regards to the faces of the blessed, is not greater than what a pearl has when displayed on a white forehead. This is what becomes of grammar in the Paradiso, the temporary, mutable appearance on the page of a writing of light. The temporariness of such writing is evoked by the image that closes Canto III, when the faces of Picarda and Costanza, cantando vanio, come per acqua cupa cosa grave. Marking the dissipation of the, of the paradiso mode of writing and reading, a surface which, like transparency and reflection on earth, does not offer resistance or feedback in the transmission of information. Dante describes the linguistic phenomenon, this linguistic phenomenon, as if it were the exposure of light onto the page, just as happens with Picarda and Costanza, exposed by the light of Empyrean into an image of the hierarchical order in which they are disposed. 
in the text, their placement in that order now reflects the redemption of their life experiences. History is, the f is therefore redeemed by way of a transcription in the form of a palimpsest of its characters' biographies in which the old traces have been effaced, lost on the background of a white page. The divine writing condescends, as we said, to show itself to the human senses. The souls of the blessed dispose themselves in the field of vision of the pilgrim, reconstructing, that is, a fictional field of vision that would be, in the strictly non-sensorial terms of the Paradiso, unconceivable. The subtext running through the lines, however, also connects the writing with the ethical issues. It connects grammar to rhetorics, and the process regards this time the pilgrim. His frozen posture due to his internal unresolved oscillation between two doubts is what impedes his expression as well. The pilgrim is mute and almost the whole canto, as we have seen, is expounded by Beatrice. His voice does not come out since it is ruled by an individual desire. This is why the spiro breaths Therefore, voice is not emitted. The pilgrim's language, in other words, must comply in order to be emitted with ethical rules. His language must not reflect his individual velle, his individual desire, which is necessarily wrong. Because it is an expression of a strictly individual perspective, the pilgrim's language must be an expression of his own inter intellect once that intellect has been enlightened, and the verb is illustra in line 125. This enlightenment provokes the saziare, the satisfaction <clears throat> of the pilgrim's mind. And the unreachable food of the first lines is finally incorporated into the pilgrim's body as intellectual knowledge. And the enlightenment provokes the increasing hunger that is intellectual curiosity, which pushes him to continue with the sequence of his questions and ask a last one to Beatrice, which she will answer only in the following canto, as the measure of one single canto is not enough to contain the new pilgrim's intellectual quest. Further, Beatrice claims that Picarda talks about a voglia assoluta, that is bent in order to avoid a worse predicament. Quoting Beatrice, voglia assoluta non consente al danno, ma consentevi intanto in quanto teme se si ritrae cadere in più affanno. But Beatrice more precisely calls that will volontà relativa, according to the lexicon of the scholastics. The same twofold structure can be applied to rhetorics. The salda voglia, which is rada, rare, corresponds to an ease of expression to the fluid eruption of Beatrice's words. The relative will, affected by doubts, corresponds to the silent pilgrim, to his lack of language. Once reinforced by the truth, he will also have to update his linguistic tools and model them on Beatrice's speech. In conclusion, the writing of the Paradiso is made of barely visible outlines of which Dante is the scribe. The author of the Paradiso transcribes a text that emerges from a depth of light, a text whose typographical characters are almost undistinguishable, but whose grammar is fixed by God's will reflected upon it, and whose signs a human observer can detect as a writing receding into the margins of its content, leaving space for the light. In the Paradiso, the specular relation between the text and its content, that is the vision of God, produces a text without signs, without black signs. The page corresponds to a mirror of light where the writing emerges as a specular translation of the pilgrim experience, così Beatrice a me, Come io scrivo is a direct metaphor. At times almost too intense for the pilgrim's gaze to bear, as the pilgrim's collapse at the end of Canto IV signifies. 
Although dramatically overwhelmed by his experience, the pilgrim is, with his presence, essential to the representation of the Paradiso. As I introduced earlier, he is the catalyst that makes the phenomenon at the origin of the vision of the Paradiso possible. That is to say, the unfolding of the Empyrean souls through the heavens, the dramatization of that ineffable content. That dramatization transcends the human frame of learning and understanding by way of a cognitive process whose end is the theophanic content that science cannot grasp and the visual perception of the pilgrim cannot gather. A few centuries later, Eugenio Montale will return to the same rhetorical and literary mechanism, the poet as a catalyst of a, of a supernatural phenomenon and the poet's language as the only means able to deliver this phenomenon, only to transform them into the depiction of hell on earth. Thank you. Please. Intra due cibi distanti e moventi d'un modo, prima si morria di fame che il libero uomo l'un recasse ai denti. Sì, si starebbe un agno intra due brame di fieri lupi, ugualmente temendo. Sì, si starebbe un cane intra due dame. Perché, si mio tacea, me non riprendo dalle miei dubbi d'un modo sospinto, poi che era necessario, né commendo. Io mi tacea, ma il mio disir dipinto m'era nel viso il di mandar con ello più caldo assai che per parlar distinto. Fessi Beatrice qual fe Daniello, Nabucodonoso orlevando d'ira che l'avea fatto ingiustamente fello, e disse, io veggio ben come ti tira uno e altro disio, sì che tua cura se stessa lega, sì che fuor non spira. Tu argomenti, se il buon voler dura, la violenza altrui per qual ragione di meritarmi scema la misura? Ancor di dubitarti da cagione parer tornarsi l'anime alle stelle, secondo la sentenza di Platone. Queste son le question che nel tuo velle pontano igualmente, e però pria tratterò quella che più ha di felle. De Serafin colui che più s'india, Moisè, Samuel e quel Giovanni che prender vuoli, io dico, non Maria, non hanno in altro cielo i loro scanni che questi spirti che motta appariro, né hanno all'esser lor più o meno anni, ma tutti fanno bello il primo giro e differentemente hanno dolce vita per sentir più e men l'eterno spiro. Qui si mostraro, non perché sortita sia questa spera lor, ma per far segno della celestial can men salita. Così parlar convienzi al vostro ingegno, però che solo da sensato apprende ciò che fa poscia d'intelletto degno. Per questo la scrittura condescende a vostra facoltate e piedi e mano attribuisce a Dio ed altro intende. E Santa Chiesa, con aspetto umano, Gabriele e Michel vi rappresenta, e l'altro che Tobia rifece sano. Quel che Timeo dell'anime argomenta non è simile a ciò che qui si vede, però che, come dice, par che senta. Dice che l'alma alla sua stella riede, credendo quella quindi esser decisa quando natura per forma le diede. E forse sua sentenza è d'altra guisa che la voce non suona ed esser puote con intenzion da non esser derisa. Se l'intende tornare a queste rote l'onor della influenza e il biasmo, forse in alcun vero suo arco percuote. Questo principio, male inteso, torse già tutto il mondo quasi, sicché Giove, Mercurio e Marte a nominar trascorse. L'altra dubitazion che ti commuove a men velen però che sua malizia non ti poria menar da me altrove parere ingiusta la nostra giustizia negli occhi dei mortali è argomento di fede e non di eretica nequizia ma perché puote vostro accorgimento ben penetrare a questa veritate come desiri ti farò contento se violenza e quando quel che pate niente conferisce a quel che sforza, 
non fuor quest'alme per essa scusate, che volontà, se non vuol, non s'ammorza, ma fa come natura face in fuoco, se mille volte violenza il torza. Perché se ella si piega assai o poco, segue la forza, e così queste fero, possendo rifugir nel santo loco. Se fosse stato lor volere intero, come tenne Lorenzo in sulla grada e fece muzio alla sua man severo, così l'avrea ripinte per la strada onde eran tratte, come fuoro sciolte. Ma così salda voglia è troppo rada. E per queste parole, se ricolte l'ai come dei, è l'argomento casso che t'avrea fatto noia ancor più volte. Ma or si t'attraversa un altro passo dinanzi agli occhi, tal che per te stesso non usciresti, pria saresti lasso. Io t'ho per certo nella mente messo, calma beata, non poria mentire, però che sempre al primo vero appresso. E poi potesti da piccar da udire che l'affezion del vel costanza tenne, sì che la par qui meco contraddire. Molte fiate già, frate, Adivenne che per fuggir periglio contra grato si fe di quel che far non si convenne, come al meone che di ciò pregato dal padre suo la propria madre spense, per non perder pietà si fe spietato. A questo punto voglio che tu pensi che la forza al voler si mischia e fanno sì che scusar non si possono l'offense. Voglia assoluta non consente al danno, ma consentevi intanto in quanto teme se si ritrae cadere in più affanno. Però quando Piccarda quello spreme della voglia assoluta intende e io dell'altra, sì che ver diciamo insieme. Cotal fu l'ondeggiar del santo rio che uscì dal fonte onde ogni ver deriva, tal puose in pace uno e l'altro disio. O amanza del primo amante, o diva, dissi io appresso, il cui parlar minonda e scalda sì che più e più m'avviva, non è l'affezion mia sì profonda che basti a render voi grazia per grazia. Ma quei che vede puote a ciò risponda. Io veggio ben che giammai non si sazia nostro intelletto se il ver non lo illustra di fuor dal qual nessun vero si spazia. Posasi in esso come fera illustra, tosto che giunto là, e giugner puollo, se non ciascun disio sarebbe frustra. Nasce per quello a guisa di rampollo a pie del vero il dubbio, ed è natura che al sommo pinge noi di collo in collo. Questo mi invita, questo m'assicura con reverenza donna a dimandarvi d'un'altra verità che mi è oscura. Io vo saper se l'uomo può soddisfarvi ai voti manchi, sì con altri beni, che alla vostra statera non si emparvi. Beatrice mi guardò, con gli occhi pieni di faville d'amor, così divini, che vinta mia virtute di Elereni, e quasi mi perdei, con gli occhi chini.